Well, today on the topic, to be or not to be, that is the question, amen. To be or not to be, we begin this afternoon in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through verse 8. Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 1 and reading through verse number 8. I read today from the King James text. The word of the Lord reads, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days. Hence, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Master, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the presence and power of the Holy Ghost, which we feel always in the house of God as we sing the grand old songs of the church, reminding us of great truths which we celebrate with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Master, the word of God is now to go forth. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the touch of God. We need the power of God to flow as the word of God goes forth. That it might confirm in the hearing of every hearer that that which, be, which is being spoken is truth. It is not merely the opinions or the ideologies of men but it is truth which has been inspired and revealed by the Holy Ghost. Touch the ear of every hearer. Touch the lips as well of the speaker. Let me today, O oh God, be a blessing and encouragement to the people of God. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Praise God. Amen. Growing up as a kid in the Pentecostal church, I frequently heard this passage preached, Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I heard about every kind of explanation under the sun as to what exactly the Lord meant when he said you shall receive power. Power for what? 
According to the holiness movement, it's power to live right and to do right. Glory to God. So that you can live above sin. Hallelujah. According to the Pentecostal movement, it is power over the devil and the works of darkness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You hear everything from power over sin to power over weakness and failure and faults to power over the devil and his minions. But I want to know what the Lord is saying. I don't want to know what people think he's saying. <laughs> you understand me today? As I looked at this passage, the Spirit of God lowered a revelation upon me that really thrilled my soul. He said, I make it clear what the power is for if you read the text. You know, a lot of times when I preach, I'm not saying anything that's all that brilliant or that's all that insightful. But rather, I am simply saying over and over again, read the text. It's there. It says it right there. But somehow we overlook it. Somehow we do not see it. To be or not to be is a famous soliloquy spoken by Prince Hamlet in the so-called nunnery scene of William Shakespeare's play Hamlet in the third act, scene one. The speech is named for the opening phrase, itself among the most widely known and quoted lines in modern English literature. And this very speech has been referenced in many works of theater, literature, and music to be or not to be. In reading our primary text, the Holy Ghost caused something to jump out at me. He caused me to realize that the power was being given according to the primary text. Listen to me, children. So that we might be witnesses. The power is not given so that we might, listen carefully, so that we might do anything. The power of the Holy Ghost is not given to the church to enable the church to do anything. It is given to the church to help the church be something. What are we to be? He said, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Oh, hallelujah. You see, the problem with many people in the Christian church is they think that witnessing they think that the, spread, uh, the spreading and the sharing of the gospel is done exclusively through the preaching of the word. But in Acts 1 and 8, the Lord Jesus Christ makes it abundantly clear that it is imperative that the church be witnesses. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Listen to me carefully, children. He did not say that the church witness. <laughs> There's a difference. There's a difference. If there is any message that is failing to flow from pulpits in America today. It is the message to the people of God that we are called to be something. What we are called to be is something more than what the unbelieving world is. And what we are called to be, listen to me, what we are called to be serves as a witness 
to the resurrected Christ. Oh my Lord, when God's people are what God's people are called to be, the world stops in its tracks and takes notice that we have been with Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, when we live like we're supposed to live, when we walk like we're supposed to walk, when we talk like we're supposed to talk, when we be what we're supposed to be, our very existence testifies mm -hmm. to a risen Christ. You know, I love the fact that in the modern world, people run around proudly proclaiming themselves to be Christians. But in the Word of God, no one ever declared themselves to be a Christian. Nowhere in the Word of God was it ever found that someone said, I am a Christian. No, because the Greek word that is translated Christian literally means Christ-like. And according to the Word of God, the early believers were first called Christians, listen to me now, by unbelievers. They were first called Christians by observers. They were first called Christians by the world. By those who were not part of the church. But they saw those who had embraced and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They saw those who were full of the Holy Ghost and power. And what they saw in those people was that they looked an awful lot like the one they preached. Mm -hmm. My, how far the church has fallen. How far are we today from being in a position, now we have people who call themselves Christians, and I wish to heavens they would shut their lying mouths. Because while they proclaim to be Christ-like, they are nothing like Christ. Nothing at all like the Lord. They do not look anything like Him. And the reason they do not look like Him, listen to me children, is because while they may have had an experience with the Holy Ghost, while they may have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost at some point in their life, somewhere they decided that things worked better. Listen to me carefully now. When they drove, I look at the Christian experience like this. When we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, God invites us to sit in the back seat of a great big stretch limousine. And he said, now you take it easy. Glory to God. You walk in peace with all men. Don't be argumentative. Don't be debating. Don't be nasty. Don't be hateful. Pray for them that hate you and love your enemies. And you just sit there and relax. If there's any any kind of revenge to be had, if there's any vengeance to be sought, I'll take care of it in due time. You just sit there and relax. Now let me drive. That's what being full of the Holy Ghost is like. The Word of God said, for as many as are led by, I'll bring it into modern vernacular as many as are chauffeured by the Holy Ghost hallelujah as many as are led by the Spirit of God they are the sons of God as many as are chauffeured by the Spirit of God they are the sons of God the problem with many in the church today is that somewhere along the line the road gets a little bumpy and 
and we become uncertain of the path that we're being driven on. We don't know the road. We're not familiar with the territory. And all of a sudden we become fearful and distrusting. We don't find ourselves able to really trust God and lean on the Lord and let him drive. So all of a sudden we risk the wheel away from him because we're more comfortable when we're back in the driver's seat. A lot of people don't realize, but once you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you then are on a lifelong mission to learn how to surrender to the leadership, to yield to the leadership of God's Spirit. It's a daily journey. Every day we have to yield to the leadership of God's Spirit. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you something I'm not proud to tell you. But even this old preacher boy has a problem with that sometimes. Sometimes when things in this world look a little stormy and they look a little out of place and I feel uncertain and insecure, I find myself suddenly jumping into the driver's seat and thinking that I know best how to respond. I know best how to react. I know best what to do. Rather than letting the Spirit of the Lord lead me. Am I telling the truth today? No, it takes, takes a while to learn to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to tell you, I used to be a whole lot better at it. Before I came out in 89. And then for a few years I went through being bashed and beaten and abused by people. My own family people I had known for decades, churches, pastors, people that I had thought of as dear friends, strangers. I never in my life knew what it was to be hated by a stranger without cause. But boy, after you come out, live in New York City, live somewhere, walk down the street with friends who perhaps are a little more obviously gay than you are. And all of a sudden, people driving by are honking their horns and yelling out the window of their car, faggots, queers. I'll tell you something, that kind of foolishness wears on you after a while. You can only take so much of it. A friend of mine, two friends of mine, and I were going, when I was out of church for that few years, we were going into a nightclub one night and we got robbed at gunpoint by two men and about scared my poor friend to death. One of my friends, bless his little heart, he had to be as stereotypical a queen as you could get. Just dramatic and <laughs> You know, just going hysterical. And I kept trying to tell him, Shane, calm down, Shane, calm down. I didn't want him to get killed. We had two men standing in front of us with guns. I didn't want him to get killed acting the fool. Thankfully, some woman coming to the club, a lesbian, happened to see movement because these men pushed us up against a building. We were in the darkest shadows. You could not see us. But this woman saw some kind of movement against the building. She wasn't sure what she saw, but she had an idea it wasn't good. She drove her car right up on the curb. And her headlights were shining right on us. And all of a sudden those men were found out and they ran, but not before. They had beat my friend over the head with that gun and hurt him pretty bad. Another friend and I had gone to my job at a car dealership in Brooklyn, New York to pick up my paycheck. And on our way out of the dealership, we were walking down the road to my car and all of a sudden, a gang of about six or eight young men came at us with baseball bats and chains and whatever else they were carrying. 
and they were going to gay bash us. Well, I was at a church. I was in New York City, and I wasn't dumb. I carried mace. It was raining lightly, but luckily mace works even in the rain. And they come at us, and they begin to swing at us. And I lifted my mace, and I just began to spray it in every direction. And of course, with the rain and the wind, some of it came back on us as well. So we burned some, and our eyes bothered us some. But I'll tell you, all of a sudden, you heard one of these fellows say, He's got mace! And they dispersed. Went through an experience with... My former partner, he got sick, had to be in the hospital a few days. We were renting an apartment. We got along famously with the Hispanic man and his wife and their adult son. They owned a grocery store on the first floor, had an apartment on the second floor, and rented out the third floor apartment to us. All of a sudden, because... Jason was in the hospital. Somehow or another, they got it in their head and they weren't going to be told otherwise that he had AIDS. And this is back when people were still terrified of AIDS and didn't know very much about it. And next thing I know, the sun had torn down the door to my apartment with an axe demanding that we leave the apartment. His parents didn't want anyone with AIDS living. Jason didn't have AIDS. His illness had nothing in the universe to do with AIDS. We went through more than a month of living in an apartment with no door. I slept with a baseball bat beside the bed for a month, terrified that one night that neighbor's son, uh, that landlord's son might come in while we were sleeping and try to hurt us. And I wanted to be able to respond if need be. Went through a lengthy process with the local um, city attorney, the prosecuting attorney, they led us through a process where we were finally able to arrange another apartment and make a move. And folks, I'm telling you, I've been through so much garbage. If I were to stand here today and try to tell you every anecdote and every story of every negative, nasty, horrific experience I've ever had simply because I'm part of the LGBT community, it would take me probably a month to get through all the tales of horror. That foolishness takes its toll on you after a while. After a while, you become wore out. After a while, you become angry. After a while, it's harder for you to bite your tongue or not to want to become violent or not to want to lash out in anger or not to seek vengeance or revenge. I was out of church at the time, but... Eventually, I found my way back into the church. I've said this a thousand times, and I'll say it a thousand times more. When I came back to church, when the Lord brought me back in, and I started my LGBT affirming in 1993, I had no interest in going back into ministry. I had done some pretty nasty things while I was out of church. I was going to hell anyway. Who cared? What, how, what difference did it matter? When I came back into church, it took me a good while to get a lot of things. I, the way I worded it is I let the cat out of the bag, and it takes a lot of work to get some of those cats back in the bag. I've still got some of them running loose that I struggle with every stinking day. 
that I keep thinking, Lord, when in the world am I ever going to get that cat back in the bag? I'm tired of losing my temper as easily as I do. I'm tired of getting as angry as I do sometimes. But you can't go through three, four years of consistent hate and malice and nastiness from people without cause, without reason except that it eventually takes its toll on you but when I came out when I came back to the church I made this one commitment to God I said Lord I know what I'm supposed to be just because I came out and did a lot of nasty things and hurt people and, and did things I shouldn't have done that does not give me license now to serve you on my own terms. No, the rules haven't changed. The terms of our relationship have not changed. When we dance, you're still supposed to lead. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. I said, Lord, if you'll help me, I don't know how long it's going to take. If you'll be patient with me, if you'll help me, I promise you, I'll do everything in my power to be a witness. See, there's a lot of people who witness, but their witness is nullified by what they be. Mm -hmm. How many people you know call themselves Christians? Especially now in the age of Trump, in the age of Mega, how many Christians you know that you have watched them talk like they are blind as a bat to things that are abundantly obvious and things that can be seen by a blind man. But because they have chosen to worship and to adore this evil, wicked man, because he's willing to do things for the Christian community they've wanted done for a long time. And he's willing to do it by any means necessary. And they don't care that the Republican Party, because it's not just Trump, they don't care that the entire Republican Party is as crooked as a dog's hind leg. They don't care that they're willing to lie and cheat and connive in order to manipulate things so that they can make things happen the way they want them to happen. Pastor, what are you talking about? Uh, Merrick Garland should be on the Supreme Court. He should not be the Attorney General. But the Republican Party lied and connived. Oh, it's the last year of, of uh, a presidency. He can't appoint somebody in his last year. The voters have to choose who's going to make that choice. And they robbed Obama of what was his constitutional right to appoint someone to the Supreme Court because of a vacancy. And then when the same identical circumstance arose in Donald Trump's term, all of a sudden there view had changed, hadn't it? All of a sudden, everything went in total reverse. Folks, the connivery, the chicanery, the trickery, the lack of integrity, the lack of morality that has been demonstrated by those people is mind-boggling. And here we are watching these people and most of them, while they preach against gay people and they preach against women who seek an abortion, these same people are not being what they ought to be while professing to be children of God. Professing to be Bible believers. 
you do more damage to the cause of the gospel by preaching it while not living it. Mm -hmm. I told Tommy the other day, I said, what would it look like if a missionary went to China told the locals, I'm here to present to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then every day he walked the streets and cheated people at business and kicked at people and bit at people and uh, argued with people and debated with people and was malicious and mean-spirited. Where would his message fall? It would fall flat to the ground. Nobody in that community would listen to one word he says. Because being a witness is different than witnessing. Mm -hmm. And the Lord did not call us to witness. He called us to be a witness. My Lord have mercy in John chapter 1 verses 10 through 13 he was in the world and the world was made by him not them him and the world knew him not he came unto his own and his own received him not but as many as received him to them gave he power to become you know what the root word of become is be the power to be, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, the character of Hamlet that is, contemplates death and suicide weighing the pain and unfairness of life against the alternative death, which he considered might be worse. But while the opening line may be somewhat poetic and very memorable, it suggests that life existence is defined as simply being, existing. Many live their lives as if surviving day to day, continuing simply to live, is somehow a satisfactory state of being. But God has called us to be much more. He's called us to more than simply surviving and existing one day until the next. In 2 Peter 3, 9 through 14, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him 
in peace without spot and blameless. We know the passage in Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This is what we are called to be. We are called to be a people of faith. We are called to be a people of peace. We are called to be a people of godliness, meaning that we prefer to do things in a manner like unto Jesus rather than do them as we would do them in our own flesh. In Romans 12, 9 through 21, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. When's the last time you heard a message like that? I've just told you what manner of person ye ought to be. Amen just told you what God would have us to be. Guess what the Holy Ghost is given for? To give us the power to be that. The only thing that prevents the Spirit of the Lord from being able to help us be that is when we demand that we drive the car. As long as we let the Lord stay in control, He will give us the power to be exactly what I've just read to you. Colossians 4, 5, and 6, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Let your speech be always with grace. Yeah, that's for those of you who go to gay pride parades and rallies and shout and scream that Yet God hates gays and God hates queers. That is speech that is always seasoned with salt, always filled with grace. No, it is not. It's foolishness. Mm -hmm. It's garbage. Mm -hmm. 1 Timothy 5, 11 through 13. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, gossips, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not to be or not to be. Are we going to allow God to give us the power to be a witness? 
Are we foolishly going to think we can drive the car and ask the Lord to ride instead of drive? And somehow the outcome is still going to be that our witness will be effective. 1 Peter 4.15 But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, listen, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Man, I know more Christians today who are busybodies in other men's matters. They're more worried about what other people are doing than they are what they do. But God has given us the power to be to be what? To be a witness. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. What's Paul saying? He's saying in the process of being what you're called to be, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer trials. You're going to suffer difficulties. That's part of the process. I mean, that's part of what happens to someone who is what they're supposed to be. Romans 14, 16 through 23, Let not your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, it's not the law, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is of sin. Paul is talking about the law. I've talked about this before. Any time Paul talks about the law, and he points to a specific law, in this case, he's referring to the dietary laws. He could, in, in truth, he could be speaking of any one of the laws, any of them. Because the rule is to break any one law, you're guilty of all. So therefore, it's not like this law is worse or, or more severe than any other. So therefore, when Paul says, don't destroy your brother over the law, he said, if there's something in the law you feel you shouldn't do, don't do it. If there's something in the law that you somehow feel okay with and you feel comfortable with, he said, happy is the man who can do it without feeling condemned over it. Do you hear what I'm telling you? He said, you got faith? Have it unto yourself. Your walk with God is your walk with God. This is the manner of man and woman that God has called us to be, folks. 
Can you imagine what the church would look like if it was full of people that actually lived these things I'm talking about today instead of just read them out of the book? Matthew 5, 37 through 48, almost done. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee. And from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? But be ye perfect, meaning mature, grown, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The power today that is vested in the Holy Ghost filled believer by reason of the presence of God's Spirit in our lives is the power to help us be a witness. Our witness is not found in our speech, but rather in our manner of life and in our conduct. One who preaches godliness but who lives wickedness is rendered ineffectual by reason of his or her conduct. So before evangelism, godliness is required. Before you can evangelize, you first have to learn how to live right. Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Because the most important form of evangelism is observation. You know, I remember Brother Gillum telling me years and years ago, and I never forgot it. It has been part of my ministry for as many years as I've been in ministry. When I'm teaching on Wednesday night, this concept is always in the back of my mind. People say, well, Pastor, you said last Wednesday, you know, it doesn't matter whether you preach this is a sin or that is a sin or this is a sin or that is a sin. No, it doesn't matter. I'll tell you, Brother Gillum told me something that has resonated with me for decades. He said, Chuck, he said, the outside is easy. It's always easy to get the outside looking good. It's always easy to get people follow the rules and said it's the inside getting people to act right and do right that's the hard part and then he said to me he said as a pastor he said the most powerful teaching tool you have is not the microphone it's not the pulpit it's not the sound system he said it is your example He said, you don't have to get in the pulpit and preach long hair and long dresses. You don't have to get in the pulpit and preach close-toed shoes. And women ought to have hosiery on. And they shouldn't wear makeup and jewelry and blah, 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 blah. He said, no. He said, you don't hear me preaching those things, do you? And Brother Gillum was as old-time holiness as anybody ever was. 
He said, no. He said, sister, go on and I live it. So look at our church. We got a hole in this church. You know why? Because the pastor and his wife set the example. Say, preacher, if you're not up in the pulpit preaching against this and against that and against this and against that, then people are never going to get the message. This is where you and I differ. This is where you and I disagree. I believe what Brother Gillum told me. If I live the example, they'll learn by reason of my example. I don't have to preach against uh, promiscuality, uh, promiscuousness. I don't have to preach against drunkenness. I don't have to preach against drug use. I don't have to preach against a lot of things. Because, honey, if people will look at my example, they will learn to live differently than that. If the only way people are going to hear anything that tells them that they ought not to do certain things is they got to hear you preach it, then that just tells me you're not doing a very good job of being what you're supposed to be. Because if you were being what you're supposed to be, your example would be a witness. Am I telling the truth today? Yes, sir. My Lord, have mercy. The Holy Ghost helps us to be the kind of person God desires for us to be. Being what the Lord has called us to be serves as our first line of testimony in the midst of a lost and dying world. To be or not to be, yes, that is the question. And the Holy Ghost comes to empower us to be. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, and I'm closing right now. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be mature, be grown, be complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you to be or not to be I don't know about you but some years ago I told the Lord I'm going to be what you want me to be it may be a difficult